That's so why you point of curiosity then, when you're working with an actor, singer, actor, dancer, or mm -hmm. actor, actor, and this is what you're working on, yes. if in the process of a performance they actually start to feel something, how do you address that? They have to be, hopefully through rehearsal it's been addressed to a certain extent, that they realize that again, if they are, I use this phrase all the time, if you start feeling emotionally drawn into uh, your character or what you're describing at the moment, that's not something that, I ha that you have to instantly try to turn off and negate. What I'm saying is don't cultivate it. Don't think that that's yeah. the important thing. In fact, I would say instantly you want to try to stay in control and focus on the people that you're talking to. And focus on the next part of the story that you're telling. Yes. Because this is the, I mean, it is the same yeah. as Shakespeare. Shakespeare is a, a remarkably potent playwright. And if you start to follow the images and the sounds of the words and the images of the words yeah. and the meaning of the words, as you tell the speech, the story, the soliloquy, enormous emotion can be engendered in you yes. by the fact that you're speaking the situation. But rather than to cave and fall back and then to be at mercy of that motion, you just roll, let that roll into the next part of the story yes. that you're telling. Yeah. And so you're never caught and held Otherwise back by lost. the emotion. You get lost. It's like an yeah. enormous snowball and you're just on a larger and larger snowball. Yeah. And, and, and different people, there's going to be different ways that people can find to deal with that. I can think of an actress who was able to cry with enormous ease and it's the sort of thing that of course always seems to impress audiences mem uh, audience members. It can be an impressive thing to be able to cry on demand, but it can also be a very dangerous thing if someone p falls into that again and again and again, that the tears are something that come. But that's, so that's method, that's naturalism, that's a cave yes. And I want to talk about that later because I want to talk about the lineage. Yes. Like we talked about the lineage of dance. Um, I want to talk about the lineage of acting, but I don't want to go there quite yet. I want to ask, you both trained as dancers mm -hmm. and as ballet dancers. Mm -hmm. So how did the switch come from two ballet student dancers to the interest in the Baroque and reawakening this other form? How did that switch happen? You talk about tapo music and the... Yes, the it was the music, the Baroque music attracted us yeah. in the beginning. Uh, and we realized that Baroque music uh, had a great deal of dance music and the dance music came from operas. The best dance music does come from the operas. So we looked into the operas. We found that they were never performed and uh, people just didn't seem to think that they were performable. We actually got jobs at the Moulin Rouge in Paris, um, which certainly taught us that we did not want to be part of the entertainment industry ever again. But we also got to look at some Baroque scores and uh, research the dance there with certain teachers and... So you were dancing at uh, Moulin Rouge? Yes. So could just briefly describe some of the dance pieces oh. you were oh, doing? Oh, please, well, no. Okay, for briefly, contrast, for the can-can. Yeah. That was the dance, that's the main dance. That was the most legitimate dance yes. at the Moulin Rouge. Uh, we did not enjoy our experience at the Moulin Rouge. <laughs> How long did you dance the can-can at the Moulin Rouge? A year. Oh, yeah. Fourteen wow. shows a week. We shared, the, we shared the stage with dolphins, tanks of dolphins, with horses, with animals. And did you dance great. a can-can, Marshall? No, no only the girls a, do the can-can. What can did you girls. dance? Well, you know, there were, there were, at that time, I think there were 40 women who, uh, who were chosen, who were called sort of Doris girls, because Doris Hogue was the ballet mistress. And uh, women who had to be over five foot ten and a very specific look. But I think there were only eight men, because the Moulin Rouge is really about women, it's not about men. But the men had to be over six foot two or over six foot three, because the star of the show, the Moulin Rouge has always had a female singer as a star, was a, a marvelous black singer, Debbie de Coudreau, an American, who was, I think, six foot two or something, so the men had to be taller than her. So we were there very much to be sort of, uh, sort of partnering the girls, working with Debbie, um, oh, it was very. I find this a delicious vulgar. image. Uh, Those, the, you two who have yeah. created operas. Yeah. It was only it a was way to make money and be yes. in Paris. Is but there any Robert, footage of this uh, dancing? Oh, no, there isn't. Oh, there's come not. on. No. But, Robert, the thing is, it, it, I think, let me just back up a little because there's, there's you know, we, we, first, we first started hearing 
this music on a regular basis because of Tafel Music, because someone gave us tickets to a Tafel Music concert. And um, before that, you were ballet. Is yes, that we, right? were, we were entirely immersed in ballet, although we had had a music education. Jeanette played the violin. We went to concerts. I mean, we were, we were well-rounded dance students. But we had never encountered anything like Tafel Music before. We had never encountered a period orchestra. The whole experience, not only how they played, which was already rather thrilling and athletic and interesting, but also it was the repertoire they were playing. Both of us having strong theater music educations, and suddenly we were hearing some of the most glorious music we had ever heard, both vocal and instrumental. And when we looked at the, at the program, it was almost invariably from operas and ballets we had never heard of, and by composers we had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And we're being told in the program notes at Tafel Music, these were the most famous composers in the world. It was like suddenly standing on your head. And what is it about Baroque music that struck the chord in you? Oh. No, oh, it's, yeah. it's dynamic, it's energetic, yes. it's gorgeous, it's, uh, it's full of its feeling in its own way. Yes, it does exactly what we were talking about with the acting. Baroque music is written to elicit an emotional response from you. You are at the mercy of the music. You feel yourself being carried places. You find yourself breathing in a different way. It is the most, and I mean this in a wonderful sense, the most manipulative music I had ever encountered. It carries you somewhere you don't even know where you're going. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. I mean, I'm trying to think of a Rhapsody by Chopin as oh, opposed yes. to well, a Chopin. But this is a fantastic Chopin. too. But, but this is different. This it's is different how, yeah, it's the emotionality it has, it, is different. Again. And again, it's about structure, balance, for a different idea of what balance is, a different idea of what structure is. The same people that were going to a dance class on a daily basis so they could be physically balanced, the same people who believed that having their emotions in check meant that they were intellectually and emotionally balanced, were also listening to and writing this music. It's a certain emotional and intellectual state that the world was in, in right up until the 18th and early 19th century. I think maybe you could say the Baroque has more of a universal feel and the Romantic has a more personal feel. Right. Again, right. I think we're talking Apollonian, Dionysian. We're talking about some music that is striving to different ends. It's, it's meant to elicit different responses. That's why the abstraction in the dance and the theater as well, it, it gives a universal message rather than a personal experience. I right. think that's the idea. Because I know in the 19th century, theater, especially in the last half, it got very, what I call, soggy. Mm -hmm. Very emotional soggy. There was a lot of this, there was a lot of pulling the heartstrings, yeah. so to speak, and making the audience a, lo yes. a lot of really soggy stuff, against which the, the backlash of, in theory, realism and Stanislavski is there has to be some rigor of observation brought back to the art. Mm -hmm. It cannot just be large romantic gestures to make you feel something. And but you see, th those people who were making large romantic gestures also felt that they were feeling large romantic emotions. It's, the fact is, the emotions became so cultivated in everything possible done to be able to feel those emotions, to broaden those emotions. Eventually, it started, like every movement, it started to hit a brick wall. It started to turn in on itself, and it had to be reinterpreted once again. But I think the romantic actor was striving for precisely what the Stanislavski or the method actor was striving for right. as well. So there you are at the Moulin Rouge. There you are then researching Baroque texts, Baroque Yes, we had some wonderful people from the Royal Ontario Museum, who, knowing what we were doing, who gave us a letter of introduction to uh, curators at the Bibliothèque Nationale at the Opera Comique. We were actually able to go and research Baroque dancing, Baroque acting techniques, the types of choreology that existed so that you were able to reconstruct what the dancing and the acting So choreology is actual of the... It's dance notation. Dance notation, yes. so you could actually see the steps, the form, the body. The yes, uh, it, it shows the steps and then you read about the, the other details. They're right. described minutely. Minutely such uh, in as... In minute detail, I mean. Such as 
Um, Neck, deportment, shoulder. How you hold your arm, how you shade the head over the arm. Uh, all the steps are described, how, how you lift the heel off the floor. Reading dance notation is like reading music. It's, it's right. the same phenomenon. We're taking something that exists in one form and turning it into another form, but so that it can be translated. Uh, effectively. And back. because ballet actually did grow out of this, very clearly grew out of this, it was immensely helpful in terms of flow of movement to have had the ballet so that you, you knew how steps connected in ballet. I, I, reading it on the page, I could imagine somebody could come out rather stiff, but uh, and knowing that ballet, of course, had, had, had the Romantic era influence, it still helped tremendously to know ballet in terms of flow of movement. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I think. In, in, order to, in order to understand another period, you have to see what came after it, but you also have to be very aware of what came before. I mean, because there aren't just clear divisions saying, yep. this is Rococo, this is Baroque, this is Romantic, this is. They're all of those, I mean, those, those are just comfortable terms that we have to, to sort of assist us when we're talking. And in, in noble dancing, in Baroque dancing, Am I right, the spine, the head, the neck, the spine, is its unit, as opposed to uh, ballet or modern dance, where it's... Yes, it's pretty... Am I right in, in classical ballet, it's pretty much a unit, too, but modern dance breaks that. Uh, and right. ballet does nowadays, is, of course, yes, as well. There's a suppleness in the back yes, now in ballet yes, that you Yes, because, wouldn't have had of course, the women were corseted. Yes, it was very, very much an upright figure. So 19th century ballet would have had a more unified spine. Yes. 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 I mean, women were still corseted in the 19th century. The, the shapes of the corsets changed so that there was more fluidity in the back as you get into romantic ballet. But again, it's, the corseting comes back to the same thing. Corseting in the 18th century is not simply some strange idea of tormenting women. Uh, corseting comes back to that same idea that the rational body is a controlled body. The rational mind is a controlled mind. We control the body through dance classes. We control the body through encasing it as well. And it's why people used to wrap children in swaddling clothes. It wasn't just for convenience. They honestly believed that babies' movements, as they were finding their limbs, they referred to that movement as spastic movement. They felt that was movement of a being that was not yet rational. And there was the potential for that child to injure themselves because they couldn't control how they move. Are we talking upper classes, middle classes, and lower We're classes? We're talking across the board. Across the board. Across the board. Children were wrapped so they couldn't move, so that they could be protected. And over a period of time, they were, for want of a better word, they were released mm -hmm. and taught how to control their limbs, consequently how to control their mind, so that they would be rational. So and we are paralleling the age of enlightenment, so it's in, yes, mental, very much rational so. as well. Although, yeah. there, yes, absolutely, the noble style um, flowered in the age of enlightenment. At the same time, there was always that Commedia dell'arte grotesque style, mm -hmm. where we see pictures of people in the splits or throwing their legs over their heads, yeah. and the boulevard theaters and everything that was happening outside of the Paris Opera, um, and slowly the two came together. Yes, but, the, but those were the iconoclasts, those were the people who were making fun, who were sort of... Yes, but eventually they, uh, they took over. Oh, absolutely. The noble style died yes. out and... Yeah, right.